You're driving on a two-lane road. Suddenly, an oncoming car pulls out to pass. You're dangerously close to a head-on collision. Hi, I'm Christopher Reeve, and welcome to the Valvoline National Driving Test. Would you know what to do in that situation? Unfortunately, many people don't. Sending their cars to graveyards like this and themselves to another kind altogether. Well, let's start the program with a question. What part of the car causes the most accidents? The answer, of course, is the driver. 85% of all traffic accidents are caused by mistakes made by drivers. And since about 164 million of you drive, we're going to help you learn some things that could save your life or someone else's. It's a test of your driving knowledge. 25 questions totaling 100 points. This test has been developed in association with the National Safety Council, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and the Automobile Association of America, as well as other safe driving organizations. Look at it as a wake-up call, designed to help you wake up to the fact that there's something you can do to be a better driver and help reduce the staggering number of traffic accidents in this country. Over 2 million disabling injuries and close to 50,000 deaths a year. Now, to take the test, all you need is an answer sheet from the current TV guide, or you might have this booklet put out by Valvoline. If not, a piece of paper and a pencil will do. At the end of the program, we'll add up our scores and see how we did. Part one of the test is called a good defense. When we come back, we'll find out what we can all do to protect ourselves on the road. Christopher Reeve will be right back with guest stars Meredith Baxter Burning, Dick Butkus, Walter Cronkite, Sarah Gilbert, Hulk Hogan, Bruce Jenner, Harry King, Lorenzo Lamas, Paul Newman, John Ritter, Susan Rattan, William Shatner, Susan Sullivan, Randy Travis, Al Unser Jr., and Betty White. The Valvoline National Driving Test. Can you meet the challenge? This important program is brought to you by Valvoline Motor Oil and the people of the Valvoline Oil Company. I think everybody thinks they're an expert when it comes to driving. I think we all think that we are the best driver there is. Obviously, that's not the case. Each one of us can learn more about good defensive driving. One of the big reasons why Valvoline is sponsoring this national driving test is to give people that kind of an experience. Let them take a test. Let them find out how much they know and how much they don't know about the rules of the road. Welcome to the Valvoline National Driving Test. No matter which way you find yourself headed, a good defense is your best protection. Well, it's time for the first question on the test. It's worth four points. You're driving on a two-lane road. Passing is allowed in either direction. An oncoming car pulls out to pass, and he's coming head-on in your lane. What should you do? A, turn quickly into the left lane. B, slow down and move to the right. C, stay in your lane and maintain your speed. D, stop immediately in your lane. Once again, the oncoming car is heading right for you. What should you do? The correct answer is B. Slow down and move to the right. Slowing down will help you maintain control. And moving to the right gets you out of the way. Do these at the same time and be prepared to keep moving to the right, even if you have to drive off the road completely to avoid a collision. OK, next question, number two. You're driving a car, approaching a blind intersection where there are no stop signs or signals. Suddenly, a car appears from the cross street. You strike it broadside. How could you have avoided this? A, turn sharply to the left. B, sounded your horn as you approached the intersection. C, braked and then kept your foot over the brake pedal as you approached the intersection. Or D, there was nothing you could have done about it. The correct answer is C. Braked, and then kept your foot over the brake pedal as you approach the intersection. If you're coming up to an uncontrolled intersection, 
that is one with no stop signs, traffic signals, or police controlling traffic, you need to be especially careful. Slow down by braking slightly, and then keep your foot just above the brake pedal. This covering your brake allows you to react much faster. For example, if you're traveling at 30 miles an hour, you can stop 20 to 25 feet earlier than if you still had your foot on the gas. And that movement could mean the difference between life and death. So if you answered correctly, answer C, you give yourself another four points. I'm John Ritter. What's missing in this picture? What's missing is the best defense any driver or passenger could have, safety belts. Here's a frightening statistic. Did you know that the number one killer of Americans age 1 to 40 is auto crashes? Well, if that doesn't scare you, how about this? Most of those killed in crashes were not wearing safety belts. And those not wearing belts are twice as likely to be injured critically. Safety belts save lives. And if you don't believe me, the next time you look at this picture, what might be missing is you. Here's something to think about. Out of every 100 people, 86 of us stand a chance of being in an accident that causes injury sometime during our driving careers. With that in mind, here's our next question. Number three, worth four points. You're driving down a two-lane road, the car in front of you stops suddenly, and you slam into its rear end. How could you have avoided this collision? A, look further down the road. B, left more distance between your car and the car in front of you. C, step down your brake harder. D, watch the brake lights of the car ahead. Once again, the car in front of you stopped suddenly. How could you have avoided slamming into it? The correct answer is B, left more distance between your car and the car in front of you. You should always be looking 12 to 15 seconds ahead, about the equivalent of a city block. Well, give yourself another four points if you answered B. And here's a good rule of thumb to make sure you're following at a safe distance. Use what's called the two-second rule. Watch the vehicle in front of you pass a fixed object or point like this telephone pole. Then count to yourself 1,001, 1,002. If your car reaches that same fixed point before you finish counting, you're too close. Now let's move on to question four. We've all been here before. It's night, the guy coming toward you is blinding you with his high beams. You've already tried to signal by using your headlights. The other guy doesn't respond. What you should do now is turn on your high beams to counteract the glare to help you see the roadway. Is that true or false? Well, the answer is false. You should not turn on your high beams while you encounter another car. In fact, in most states, it's actually illegal to have your high beams on within 500 feet of an oncoming vehicle. While it's common practice to briefly flash your lights to warn another driver, it's very dangerous to leave your high beams on because it can blind the driver of the oncoming vehicle, actually doubling the danger. So if you answered false, you add another four points to your score. Now here's an extra credit question not on the test form. What do safe drivers and good football teams have in common? Answer, good defense. Watch number 51. I'm Dick Butkus. As a former football player, I know the importance of a good defense. Don't ever try that at home or on the road. Look at it this way. The highway is one place you don't want to sack or be sacked by somebody. Out there, you're the only guy on your team and everybody else is out to get you. For instance, car A might be making a right turn from the left lane, or car B might be running a red light, or car C might be cutting you off in your lane or cars D, E, F, G, and H might have bad brakes, bad steering, bad karma, or a bad driver having a bad day. And they're all out to get you in this car. So be alert, watch their every move, and anticipate what they're going to do. That way, when cars A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H do this, you can do this. Good defense makes good sense. Saves a heck of a lot on markers, too. OK, now it's time for the last question, number five, in the good defense portion of the driving test. It's another true or false question, and it's worth four points. 
You're driving on a multi-lane highway, and the car that is overtaking you appears to be out of control, weaving from side to side. The best course of action is to stay in your lane and maintain your speed. True or false? The answer is false. The correct response is, if safe, get into another lane, or even pull off the road and stop. You want to get as far away as you can get from a weaving driver. There are lots of warning signs to watch out for on the road. I'm William Shatner, and perhaps the most important warning signs are the ones given by impaired drivers. They're the ones going over or under the speed limit, or the ones straddling the lane markings, or stopping too far behind the stoplight. They might have the windshield wipers on when it's not raining, or their windows down in the freezing cold. They're loaded with warning signs. Unfortunately, they're usually loaded, too. Steer clear of them. By the way, 11 states have hotlines so you can report impaired or drunk drivers. And even if your state doesn't, you can always dial the local police or 911. Okay, well, if you got all five questions right in the good defense section, you're cruising along with 20 points. Coming up next, rules of the road. And if you don't pay attention to them, you could end up like these folks. Audrey, when they close the road, they put up big signs like this one. Ah! There's a motor oil that talks about quality, always has, always will. Well, Valvoline makes the highest quality motor oil recommended by any automobile manufacturer. Oh yeah, unlike the competition, Valvoline also makes the motor oil used by seven out of 10 Indy 500 crew chiefs. That's seven out of 10 Indy crew chiefs over the last 10 years. People who know, use Valvoline. There is nothing that I enjoy better than racing Indy cars. It's a good feeling to know that you have the best race car that is on the racetrack, or is, in our terms, the most hooked up car that's out there. The oil temperature coming out of the engine before it gets to the oil cool is probably somewhere close to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, if it starts to break down, then that's when it's gonna cause you problems. In the 12 years of IndyCar racing that I've been in, I've always used Valvoline. I've never had an oil-related engine problem. Well, I think we have uh, had enough experience with Valvoline in the race car that we know that that's one part of the race car on race day that we don't have to worry about. You can't get a better product than what Valvoline has to offer. People who know use Valvoline. You can't settle for second best. The minute you do that, you're settling for second place. Now, back to the Valvoline National Driving Test, starring Christopher Reed. Let's take a drive. It's a nice day. Maybe you're dropping off the children or taking a quick trip to the market, going to work. Nothing particularly out of the ordinary, just a normal drive down a street in any town USA. Well, now it's time to test your memory. Question number six. You've just been on the driver's seat on a typical drive. What was the last road sign you saw? Give up? Well, let's take the same drive again and see what we missed. The last road sign was the symbol for school crossing. If you missed that question, you weren't alone. We asked some people who were actually driving that same route to tell us the last road sign they saw, and here's what they said. Stop sign. Stop sign. The last one I noticed was the stop sign. The one that goes straight and two curves, you know? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I don't remember. A pedestrian crossing? 80% of all the drivers could not tell us the road sign. Question number seven, worth a half a point each. Identify and define these eight signs or signals. Watch carefully now. Here we go. Sign number one. Here's sign number two. Sign number three. Now sign number four. 
Sign number five. Here's sign six. Sign number seven. And the final sign, number eight. Got them all? Let's go back and see how we did. Remember, you had to do more than just name the sign. You had to know what it means, too. Sign number one, slippery when wet. That's self-explanatory. Sign number two, red light, green arrow. This means that all traffic going in the direction of the arrow may proceed. All other traffic has to stop. Sign number three, no U-turn. We called them UEs when I was growing up. No U-turn means no 180 degree turns. Sign number four, road narrows. This means that the road might become significantly narrower ahead. Sign number five, merge. This means you have to blend in with the existing traffic. Sign number six, flashing red light. Probably the most missed symbol of all. It means come to a complete stop. Then when safe, proceed. Think of it as a stop sign. Sign number seven, wrong way. It means wrong way, don't enter. Traffic will be coming against you. Sign number eight, workers ahead. This is very important. It indicates construction workers will soon be in or alongside the upcoming stretch of road. Hi, I'm Randy Travis. Remember, give yourself a half point for each sign you identify correctly. Now, I spend a lot of time out on the road between performances, so I get to see a lot of people out there working on the road. And I tell you, it can be a pretty dangerous thing. That's why many states have started a campaign called Give Them a Break. If you're coming up to a road crew, slow down. Watch out for the workers. Remember, give them a break, and you give yourself a break, too. OK, time for question number eight on the driving test. And the lane on my left is marked on each side by a solid and broken yellow line. What's this lane for? A, passing other cars. B, left turns. C, driving around to avoid congestion. D, momentary stopping. The correct answer is B. A lane marked on each side by a solid and broken yellow line is used for beginning or ending left turns. Don't use it for anything other than preparing to make or complete the turn. In some states, U-turns are allowed from this lane, so check with your state to be sure. The question is worth four points. Hi, I'm Sarah Gilbert from Roseanne. For those of you who've watched the show, you know how hard my parents were. So they don't have a lot of time to drive me to school, which is why I spend a lot of time on the school bus. They always tell me to be careful getting on or off. Well, we want you to be careful, too. That's what this next question, number nine, is all about. If you're on the street approaching a school bus with its red lights flashing, what do you do? A, come to a complete stop, then continue carefully. B, come to a stop and wait to move until the lights are no longer flashing and the bus is moving. C, slow down and pass the bus carefully. Or D, come to a complete stop only if you see kids around. The correct answer is B. Flashing red lights on a school bus means come to a stop and wait to move until the lights are no longer flashing and the bus is actually moving. There may be kids you can't see getting on or off the bus. Remember, in most states, you don't have to stop if you're driving on the opposite side of a divided roadway. But no matter where you are, be careful. If you got that one right, answer B, you give yourself another four points. Now, question number 10 has four parts, and they're worth one point each. And these questions concern right of way, or who should yield in certain situations. The law never actually gives anyone the right of way, but it does indicate who should yield or give way when vehicles encounter one another. Here's the first situation. There's a four-way stop intersection, and cars A and B arrive at the same time. Who should yield? The answer, car A should yield to car B. Whoever arrives at the intersection first has the right of way, but when cars arrive at the same time, the car on the left should yield to the car on the right. In the next situation, two cars are facing each other, both turning onto the same street. Who should yield the right of way? The answer is car A should yield. A car making a left turn should yield to all oncoming traffic. Example C, a car approaches an unregulated intersection where a pedestrian starts to cross. There's no marked crosswalk. Who should yield? The car should yield to the pedestrian at any intersection, even if there is no marked crosswalk. And the last example, a car is about to make a right-hand turn from a driveway as car B approaches in that same lane. Who should yield? The answer is car A should yield. 
Cars entering a roadway should always yield to those already on the road. And remember, those are worth a point each. Yo, maniacs! I'm Hulk Hogan, and I yield to nobody. And when I'm wrestling in the ring, I yield to nobody. But when I'm on the road, I always yield to an emergency vehicle with its lights flashing and siren going. It's probably on its way to pick up the last dude who thought he could beat me in the ring. And take it from me, when I'm on the road, I never insist on the right of way. I can handle a 300 pound wrestler, but I'm no match for a 3,000 pound car. And neither are you. We've had 10 questions worth 40 points. Next, we'll have questions on the driving environment. Sometimes, there's just nothing you can do about what's on the road. Okay. Sometimes I'm so smart, I scare myself. That situation may be a bit extreme, but here's something I know has happened to everybody. You're driving along the street, everything's fine, then you turn a corner, and bang, you're blinded by the glare of the sun. Here's question 11. Name three things you should do as a driver to minimize sun glare. The three things you should do as a driver to reduce sun glare are, number one, make sure your windshield is clean inside and out. Number two, adjust the sun visor. Just make sure you don't block your view of the road when you do it. Number three, wear sunglasses. Polarizing gray lenses block glare most effectively. Let's try that drive again, and you'll see what you should have seen the first time. If you got all three answers, give yourself four points. Only two correct answers, two points, one answer, one point. Now from the sun to the rain, question number 12. When do you think the road is slickest during a rainfall? A, anytime it's raining. B, the first minutes of rain. C, 30 minutes after the rain stops. Or D, towards the end of the storm. Give yourself four points for the correct answer, B. The road is slickest during the first minutes of rain. Then oil on the road, which is lighter than water, floats up to the surface of the pavement. This creates a thin film of oil and a very slick driving surface. Depending on the strength of the rainfall, most of the oil is eventually washed away. You know the saying that oil and water don't mix? Well, they do create a perfect environment for a skid. Well, let's say your car does go into a skid. Here to tell us what to do is someone who knows how to handle a car, even in the worst situation. His training and skills have actually saved his life. Side by side, going into turn three. Ammo down low in the middle of the track, and Ammo may have it. They almost touch oh, the two touch wheels. And then in the wall is Al Jr. Ammo continues on. They touch wheels in turn three. Ammo continues on. You can see the damage to the number two, Al Unser Jr. Most of you will never find yourself in that situation, but you may find yourself in a skid. Whether you're doing 200 miles an hour at Indianapolis or 25 on your neighborhood street, there's nothing worse than your car suddenly shooting off in a direction you had no intention of going. Let's see if you know what to do. Question number 13 of the Valvoline National Driving Test is a multiple choice question. If your car goes into a skid, you should A, take your foot off the accelerator, B, keep your foot off of the brake, C, steer the vehicle in the direction of the skid, D, all of the above. The correct answer is D all of the above. Let me demonstrate. The instant you lose control, take your foot off of the accelerator, turn in the direction of the skid, keep your foot off the brake so that they won't lock up. Once you regain control, accelerate gently to bring the car back into a completely normal situation. Just to review, if you go into a skid, Take your foot off the accelerator and at the same time aim the vehicle in the direction of the skid without touching your brakes. Then gently accelerate to bring the car back under control. Give yourself four points if you had the correct answer, D. Sometimes you think you're doing absolutely nothing wrong on the road, but you could be breaking the law. For instance, question 14. Under what conditions can you get a ticket for actually driving the posted speed limit? 
A, during bad weather conditions. B, in heavy traffic. C, in a residential zone where children are playing in the street. Or D, all of the above. The answer is D, all of the above. Because of what's known as the basic speed law, all of the conditions listed above, plus many others, are regulated by this law, which says that if conditions make it unsafe to drive the posted speed limit, you can't drive it. Use common sense and give yourself four points if you got the correct answer, D. Hi, I'm Susan Sullivan. Excuse me, I'm just finishing my lunch. I didn't have time between appointments. Uh-oh. I ain't got past the block I'm looking for. Oh, I'm really not good with maps. Obviously not written for anybody on planet Earth. No, I'm OK. 17 block. Oh, I tell you, driving makes me thirsty. I don't know about you. Oh, great, I smeared my lipstick. Hold on a second, OK? Oh, forget about hours. There's just not enough minutes in the day. Whoops. Hi. No, I'm on my way. Yeah, I know I'm late. I just, well, I'll be there when I get there. No, actually, I'm doing a driving test. Uh-huh. Yeah, showing people what they shouldn't be doing when driving. Right. <laughs> well, as you can see, I am not driving this car. And if I was, I'll tell you, I wouldn't be doing any of the things you just saw me doing. Distractions like eating, drinking, reading, talking on the phone can take your attention when you need it most. Driving's not a part-time job, it's a full-time experience. Time now for the last question in the driving environment portion of the test. Number 15, it's a true or false question. When driving in fog, you should always use your high beams. Is that true or false? Add four points if you answered false. You should always use your low beams in fog. Most people miss this question. You'd naturally think that the more light you have, the better you can see. But the moisture in the fog reflects the light right back to you. Well, we're over halfway through the test. And at this point, if you've answered everything correctly, you should have a total of 60 points for the first 15 questions. Coming up next, we're going to look at some of the unexpected things that might happen when you're out on the road and what you can do about them. The Plymouth AAA Troubleshooting Contest, where the great mechanics of tomorrow go head to head. It really, it boils down to the ones that don't blow their cool. The gun goes off and they run to their car read the repair order, and then repair the car. I've always wanted to figure out how things work, and a car is the ultimate thing to try to figure out. This is the thing I am best at. Bring it. Nine. I have high expectations of my students. I ask and demand a lot, and I think because of that, I receive more from them. He pushes us, yeah. and he expects us to work as hard as he does. If you don't have good oil, you're gonna ruin an engine. Yeah, real quick. We use Valvoline. That's all I've ever seen at the shop there. It's Valvoline. People who know use Valvoline. There's a motor oil that advertises world-class protection. Impressive. But Valvoline is recommended by name in the owner's manuals of these world-class cars. The other motor oil is not. Whatever you drive, Valvoline makes the highest quality motor oil recommended by any car manufacturer. Around the world, people who know use Valvoline. The Valvoline National Driving Test will continue. This is not movies, but this is real. Life impacting life. Very gripping. William Shatner hosts a new series that could make a difference in your life. 911 is there to save our lives. Real heroes in true life situations. Rescue 911 premieres Tuesday, September 5th. Coming this fall, Richard Chamberlain. Returns to network television. Island Sun, Tuesdays on CBS. This is CBS. Channel 10, your 49er station. When you're hot, you're hot. 
It's a hot time for hot trucks. It's closeout time at your Ford dealer. Too much of a good thing means great selection and great closeout prices on every new truck in stock. Plus, you can get up to $1,000 cash back. Or financing as low as 2.9%. Save hundreds, even thousands on America's number one selling compact and full-size pickups. And that's before you make your best closeout deal. Ford Fever. When you're hot, you're hot. Hope the national driving test is helping make drivers a little safer, but what if you do happen to be involved in a serious accident? Coming up on News 10 Nightside, we'll explain what uh, California requires for insurance and how to get the most from your insurance company. There's a new congressman from Florida tonight, a Cuban-born immigrant who will replace the late Claude Pepper. Also coming up at 11, an update on a missing Sacramento boy, and we'll take you out to the state fair for tonight's concert by Ringo Starr. Those stories and more on night. 59 cent original tacos from Taco Bell, where the best food meets an even better price. Make a run for the border. We return to the Valvoline National Driving Test. You never know what you're going to run into on the highway. That's why. That's why we call our next section the unexpected. Welcome back to the Valvoline National Driving Test. The next three questions will test your skills in some tense situations. Hi, I'm Lorenzo Lamas. As a professional race driver, I know it's often the everyday driving that gets you into some real nail-biting situations. This section is designed to help show you what to expect when you face the unexpected. This is question number 16, and it's worth four points. You're driving on a downhill slope approaching a stop sign. When you step on the brakes, they fail. What's the first thing you should do? A, shift your car into a lower gear. B, apply the emergency brake. C, pump your brake pedal and try to build pressure. D, if possible, steer off the road to the right to a clear area. What is the first thing you should do? The correct answer is C. If your brakes fail, pump your brake pedal to try to build up pressure. That is the first course of action you should try because there still may be enough pressure. If that doesn't work, then shift into a lower gear so the engine will help you stop. The parking brake is for the final part of the stop, so apply it slowly so the brakes won't lock. Now here's question number 17. You're driving 45 miles an hour on a roadway and suddenly your right wheels drop off the edge of the pavement. What should you do? A, slow gradually before turning back onto the pavement. B, turn back onto the pavement at once. C, drive onto the shoulder and stop. D, steer straight ahead and speed up to gain maximum control of your vehicle. The correct answer is A, slow gradually before turning back onto the pavement. Keep a firm grip on the steering wheel. When it's safe and your speed is under control, turn the wheel quickly about a quarter turn to the left. Give yourself four points if you answered correctly. Question number 18 is the last question in the tales of the unexpected, and it's a real white knuckler. While driving down the street, you take your foot off the accelerator to brake and find your accelerator is stuck. After tapping the gas pedal and trying to free it, now pay attention, here's a twist. Which of the following should you never do? A, turn off your ignition. B, immediately put your car in neutral and brake. C, Reach down and try to pull the gas pedal up with your hand. D, none of the above. The correct answer is C, never try to pull the gas pedal up with your hand. This is a very dangerous action because no matter how quickly you think it can be done, your vision of the roadway is blocked. If tapping the accelerator with your foot doesn't work, shift your car into neutral and apply the brakes. Drive off the road if possible, or as far to the right side as you can. Take care, if you turn off your ignition, that you don't turn the key so far that it locks the steering wheel. Give yourself another four points if you chose the correct answer. C. Well, after 18 questions, the total number of points you could have scored, or should have scored, is... 72.
with self-service gas stations popping up on almost every street corner, we're forced to do a lot of the routine maintenance on our cars ourselves. That's why the next section of the driving test goes under the hood. Hi, I'm Susan Rattan of L.A. Law, and I have a confession to make. I'm a bit of a grease monkey. I like to work on cars. Now, here's question number 19. It has to do with car fluids. Uh, for one point each, name four fluids that should be checked regularly and replaced when necessary. By the way, there are seven, so you've got extra chances to pick four. Here are the seven fluids that should be checked and replaced when necessary. One, oil. Two, automatic transmission fluid. Three, brake fluid. Four, radiator coolant and or water. Five, battery water. Six, windshield washer fluid. Seven, steering fluid. Now remember to give yourself a point each, up to four points if you name four out of the seven fluids. Now for extra credit, see if you can identify what these fluids are. Now some manufacturers may vary, but these are the most common. Now, here's some red stuff. If you see that on the ground or on your shirt, check your automatic transmission fluid. Green stuff, well that's coolant. Uh, brown, that's oil, dirty oil. This is clean oil over here. Now this sort of reddish brown gunk, that's steering fluid. And this, that's last night's spaghetti dinner. Hi, I'm Perry King. When I'm not acting, you can often find me on a racetrack, but today I'm on a closed portion of the LA freeway to demonstrate the next question in the Valvoline National Driving Test. Now here's question number 20. Having underinflated tires on a dry road gives you A, better control of steering and braking, B, more traction, C, less control of steering and braking, or D, better gas mileage. Now, what do you think? The correct answer is C. Having underinflated tires gives you less control of your steering and braking. It's something that concerns drivers on a racetrack as much as drivers on the street. Hop in the driver's seat with me and I'll show you. Okay, we're driving down the freeway at 45 miles an hour with a set of properly inflated tires. Now, let's say that we see an object ahead that causes us to brake suddenly. And we're going to do that at the first set of cones that you see there. The second set is 50 feet past that and then 100 feet for the third set. Now, touch your screen at the point that you think that I'm going to stop. Okay, we're rolling down the freeway at 45 miles an hour, but this time with a set of underinflated tires. We placed a dummy in the road to mark the spot where I stopped before. Again, touch your screen at the point that you think that I'm going to stop. From the time I began braking, it took an extra car length to completely stop the car and one possible fatality. Remember, underinflated tires give you much less control in braking and steering your car. So give yourself four points if you answer correctly with C. Oh, one other tire tip. Don't forget the importance of proper tire tread. Now, the tread is the part of the tire that makes contact with the road. To make sure you have the proper tread, here's a real easy test. Now, you stick a penny in the groove head first. If the tread doesn't cover at least part of Lincoln's head, you're riding on dangerous tires, and that could prevent you from stopping in time or cause you to skid. Use a penny, stop on a dime. Next is one of the most important life-saving sections of the test. But first, a fact. There's 34 states and the District of Columbia that have mandatory safety belt laws, which means before you even put the key in the ignition, you have to buckle up. Question 21 is all about safety belts. There's four parts worth a point each. Here's the first. Wearing safety belts give you a greater chance of escaping a burning or submerged vehicle. True or false? For one point, the answer is true. A safety belt will increase your chances of being conscious and in position to either get out of the car or control it. If you don't think safety belts are important, watch this. Whoa. Whoa, man. I hope he's okay. Yeah, he's if the driver of this car hadn't worn a safety belt, it would have been impossible for him to have escaped injury or to have removed himself from the burning car. Continuing with part two of question 21, safety belts reduce injuries only in collisions above 15 miles an hour. Is that true or false? 
For one point, the answer is false. A driver's head can strike the windshield, the steering wheel, or the dashboard at a speed as low as five miles an hour. As an additional safety precaution, by 1990, all new cars will come equipped with airbags or automatic safety belts. And let's take a look now at how airbags work. Under normal conditions, the airbag is packed like a parachute inside the steering wheel. On impact, the airbag instantly inflates with nitrogen, cushioning the passenger from the steering wheel or the windshield. It takes just a tenth of a second for the bag to inflate and less than a second for it to deflate. Remember, the airbag only works if the passengers are held in the proper position by the safety belt. And now for part three of question 21. Safety belts are more effective on the highway than for local street driving. Is that true or false? For one point, the answer is false. 80% of accidents occur at speeds of 40 miles an hour or less. I've been wearing seat belts for a long time because I've been driving race cars for a long time. But like many drivers, I've sometimes been guilty of neglecting to buckle up on short trips. Remember, most accidents happen within 25 miles of home. So wear your safety belt going to the shopping center, too. Sometimes those short trips are when you need belts the most. Here's the next generation of drivers. And to make sure he gets his turn, pay attention to part four of question 21. Here's Meredith Baxter Burney. Okay, our next question concerns safety belts and children. This is Alexander. He's going to help us. The safest place for your baby is in an infant seat in the back seat facing backwards. Is that true or false? The answer, true. Give yourself one point. Most people think that the baby should be facing forward so you can see what's going on. Well, that's not the case. Place your baby's safety seat in the back seat facing backwards and make sure it's properly anchored to the seat with a safety belt. That's for infants. Larger babies or toddlers weighing up to 40 pounds can be buckled into forward-facing toddler seats, like this one. This seat must be secured with a safety belt, too. When a child reaches the point when his head clears the back seat, then you can use the regular safety belt. Just make sure that the shoulder strap doesn't cut into his neck. And make sure that your child and you know how to use safety belts properly. The lap belt should be tied across the hips, never across the stomach. And the shoulder strap should be comfortable, but snug. Never so loose that it would just fall off your shoulder. And remember, for many of the new cars that have the automatic safety belts, you still have to buckle the lap belt to be fully protected. She boat, a she boat. Hi, I'm Betty White for the National Driving Test. There's another whole group of passengers that we sometimes forget to think about, and that's our pets. Over 30,000 dogs were killed in car accidents last year. So if you like to take your pet along for the ride, there's some safety tips to remember. First, don't let your pet stay loose in the car. Use a pet carrier. They're inexpensive, and they'll save you and your pet a lot of worry. If you have a pickup truck, never let your dog or cat ride in the back. They can fall out if you're just turning a corner or be thrown out by a sudden stop or an accident. Depending on where you live, it may even be against the law. Also, don't let your dog ride with his head sticking out the window. Flying debris can blind an animal or cause eye and ear infections. And never, repeat, never leave your pet in a parked car. Even with the windows down, the interior can get hot enough to cause a heat stroke or even brain damage. Finally, never let your dog get behind the wheel. Unless, of course, he's passed the state driving test. All right, honey, now, here's the ignition. Can you reach the pedals? Here's another true-false question for you, worth four points. Question number 22. I've got all the mirrors on the car adjusted properly. This means I've eliminated all the blind spots. Is that true or false? Well, the answer is false, because even with the mirrors properly adjusted, there still are blind spots. Take a look. The rear view mirror allows you to see directly behind you. The side mirrors help you see immediately to either side of the car, but for a limited distance only. Take a look at what I see in the side view mirror. Nothing, right? Now take a look at what was in the blind spot. Uh, seriously, the shaded areas on this diagram show you what you can't see in your car. Here's an important tip for you when passing or overtaking another car. If you can't see that car's rear view mirror, that means they can't see you either, and you're in their blind spot. To make sure you haven't missed a vehicle behind you, turn your head for a last second check before changing lanes. 
The total points to date, if you've gotten everything right, is 88. Who uses Valvoline motor oil? People who say yes to high-performance racing, but say no to drugs. ICY stands for Inner City Youth Racing. The neighborhood where the kids on my particular team come from can probably walk out of any one of their houses and buy drugs 24 hours a day. I'm a recovering addict, and I wanted to give kids an opportunity to experience something that they would not normally be exposed to. And what we do is they're my pit crew, and we take them all across the country with us. Where I come from is pretty rough. I think if I wasn't able to join the team, I figure I would be a lost case. But I love working on cars. I want to, you know, grow up to be somebody. I don't want to grow up to be nobody. And that's what we try to teach the kids, that you know, if you stay straight and you, and you go after a goal and you work at it and you're patient, you have to be patient. It doesn't come overnight. Um, you can get, get what you want. People who know use Valvoline. Who uses Valvoline motor oil? People like champion amateur racer David Tenney. Some people have hobbies. They play a lot of golf. They play a lot of tennis. I play with cars. When it's just right and you're driving right on the edge, that's the best feeling there is. I'm using Valvoline 1030 racing oil. There's a horsepower advantage to be gained by using the lightest weight oil you can get while still giving the engine the protection it needs to run because I don't like to finish second. People who know use Valvoline. Back to the Valvoline National Driving Test, starring Christopher Reeve. Harry Grant's scene was created by special effects, but the only special effect you'd have if you really drank that much would be loss of control. Of the nearly 50,000 people who die each year in traffic accidents, over half die because of alcohol-related incidents. To see how much we know about the effects of alcohol, we've asked for a little help from one of the top celebrity drivers in the country and also a great athlete. You'll see why both are important in a moment. Here's Bruce Jenner. Thanks, Chris. Here's question number 23. It's a two-part question, each part worth two points, and they're both going to be true-false. The average mixed drink has a stronger effect on you than a glass of wine or a mug of beer. The answer is false. 1.5-ounce glass of whiskey, a 5-ounce glass of wine, or 12 ounces of beer all have the same effect on you. They all contain the same amount of alcohol. So if you answered false, Give yourself two points. Part two of question number 23. Drinking black coffee, getting some strenuous exercise, or taking a cold shower reduces the effects of alcohol. True or false? The answer, false. The only way to reduce the effects of alcohol is to stop drinking and wait. Two points for a false answer. Now to demonstrate this, I'm gonna do something that I would never do, and that is drink and drive. Now remember, I'm in very good shape, I've been racing cars for the last 10 years, so you might think, ah, I can handle a few drinks and get behind the wheel. So we set up a course with cones on it. Now I'm gonna go out and drive it, oh, about 20 miles an hour, sober. Doesn't seem to be too tough. 20 miles an hour is really pretty simple. It has been another hour. I've had two more beers, I'm up to four beers. My blood alcohol level is point 050, well below the legal limit for driving. You know, it might be the amount of beer that you might have at a party. Uh, I'm gonna take the course one more time. I really don't feel like I should be driving right now, but here I go. All right, Woo. Here we go. Whoops. And I was doing so good a minute ago. Here we go. You know what's more difficult about this? It's not so much handling the car, it's just that I really have a tendency of being more aggressive. Whew. I've only had a few beers. My blood alcohol level is way below the legal limit. 
This could have been another car, could have been a telephone pole, could have been a child. Drinking and driving is a risk in life that you really don't need to take. To sum it up, please don't drink and drive. It has been a long day here, and in my condition, I gotta find somebody to drive me home. I'll take you home, Bruce. <laughs> sure, sure. And it's not all that bad a deal to have somebody else drive you home, is it? <laughs> The next question, 24, also deals with your own physical capacity. True or false, over-the-counter medication can affect your driving ability. The answer is true. Many over-the-counter medications can affect your driving ability and reaction time. That means cold medicines, allergy pills, cough medicines, and lots more. And combining them with alcohol can multiply the effects. So learn to pay close attention to labels. This is what you should look for. This particular box says, do not drive or operate machinery while taking this medicine as it may cause drowsiness. A correct answer, true, on that question gives you another four points. And now it's time for the last question in the test. Question 25, another four points. As we get older, which ability is usually the first to deteriorate? A, reaction time, B, sense of direction, C, hearing, or D, night vision. The answer is D, night vision. It's the ability that deteriorates first and fastest, with a noticeable difference after about age 40. Test yourself. Turn the lights off in the room. Now take a look at this street sign that says Century Avenue. Assuming you have average eyesight, you should be able to see this pretty clearly. Now we're going to show you the same sign at night. Watch the clock and see when you can fully read the sign. Ready? Go. If it took you two and a half seconds, you have good vision, should be able to safely distinguish things at night. If you couldn't see it after 12 seconds, you shouldn't be driving after dark. Now, let's try this. We're going to show you a scene at night for a short period of time. Tell me how many signs, this type of sign, you can see. How many did you see? The answer is four. Look again, here's the scene and here are the signs. If you didn't see four signs, that's a sign you shouldn't be driving at night. Let's try something different now. Let's check your reaction time. You're going to see a sequence of numbers, 1 through 12, on your television screen. When I say go, I want you to touch these numbers in order as quickly as you can. Ready, set, go. How long did that take you? If your reaction time is excellent, this should have taken you five to seven seconds. If it took you 10 seconds or more, you shouldn't be behind the wheel of a car. I'm Walter Cronkite. Congratulations, you've just completed the national driving test. And we thought that the tranquility of the waterfront might be a welcome relief from all the hubbub of the streets and highways and give us a chance to reflect for a moment on what we've been doing this last hour. The National Driving Test was designed to involve you, perhaps to entertain you, but certainly to educate you, to educate all of us about America's most lethal weapon, the automobile. Bad driving kills, and it's not only you. As we've learned in this test, frequently it's the other guy. 24 years ago, I hosted a program that tested our driving knowledge. It made America aware of just how little we really knew. Since that time, the number of cars on the road has doubled, so has the number of drivers, and the risk of accident, injury, and death has risen proportionately. So before you put the key in the ignition switch again, remember the question you missed on this test. They could be the very ones that cost you your life. Chris will be back in a moment with the score. Who uses Valvoline motor oil? People like leading race car driver Al Unser Jr. If a driver ever told you, no, I don't get scared, I'm not scared, he's lying to you. The technology that goes into the Indy car is second to none. Over half the field at Indy is using Valvoline. If there was a motor oil out there that was better, it would be in my car. People who know use Valvoline. 
there's a motor oil that says it's engineered for today's smaller cars, like sports cars. But is that motor oil the first choice of the members of the Sports Car Club of America? No. Valvoline is the first choice of the members of the Sports Car Club of America. Valvoline makes the highest quality motor oil recommended by any automobile manufacturer. People who know, use Valvoline. From the highest form of professional racing. I'm trying to make my race car better than anybody else. To the weekend amateur. I want a horsepower advantage. I want to win races. From the great mechanics of today. We're professionals and we're perfectionists. To the great mechanics of tomorrow. You have to really work hard to become what you want to be. People who know use... Valvoline. 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 Please, Valvoline. People who know use Valvoline. Okay, let's see how you scored. If you got all the questions right, 100%, congratulations. You look great on paper. But remember that last year alone, one in every five drivers had some kind of a wreck. Watch out for them. If you scored 90 to 99 points, you're better than average. But it takes better than average skills to survive on today's highways. If you scored 82 to 89, that might get you a B in school, but it ranks only average in this test. And the average driver makes two and a half mistakes for each mile he drives. 76 to 81, you're a little below average. Anything below 76, you have a below average score. You should really think about your driving. You might want to take a defensive driving course. This test by no means has a definitive say on what kind of a driver you are, but it is a good guide to what you need to know. And we hope we've shown you some things you can do to make yourself a better driver and some things to watch out for with the other guy. The Valvoline National Driving Test has been brought to you by Valvoline Motor Oil. Thanks for watching and drive carefully. Well, let's hope the hour we've just spent will save some lives. We'd like to thank the following for their cooperation in designing this test. Thanks for joining us. The Ford Motor Company is pleased to have provided automobiles for the Valvoline National Driving Test. This is Harry Smith. Tomorrow, Coach Lou Holtz of Notre Dame, actor Raymond Burr on his new show, plus a look at the job that never ends, being a parent, on CBS This Morning. Stay tuned for your local news.